NFR Extra follows all your favorite cowboys, interviews legends of rodeo, and talks to the best of country music. Follow Nevada Caldwell, Ryland Bentley, and Steve Godert every week as they delve deep into the stories behind the road to gold in Vegas at the National Finals Rodeo. It's revealing, comedic, and sometimes emotional. Find it on Spotify or anywhere you listen to podcasts. NFR Extra. All dirt, all rodeo, all year. NFR Extra, Episode 80. We start 2021 with NFR contestants Jess Pope and Colton Fritzlin, and their 2020 NFR was anything but average, and that's no pun. I won the average, I'm out of college. Yeah, right? On the note of like clean slate and average meaning so much more, like this year is as close to clean slate as it it has ever been earnings wise in a long time just because they didn't come in 300,000 plus they all I mean high money was 158,000 that's something you can win at the finals so and those guys that came in number one I mean you look at Wyatt Casper the only one that it really panned out for was Shad Mayfield uh, on the tie down rope and but Wyatt Casper I mean with his lead to where it just and I think the biggest reflection of that was Sage Kimsey. You know, like you said, Brylin, is he comes in with a two hundred, I mean, two three hundred thousand dollar lead. Nobody could, you literally cannot touch him. Yep, he has it sealed up before he goes. It made it so exciting, like just from a fan. Like if you remove all the hoopla drama of where it was at or not and where it needed to be and blah 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 text text texas watching it from a from the cowboy channel perspective damn man you're like dude every night changed that average was just bumping up and down on just almost about every event and even on tie down man i mean like shad was like it was like dude you better like Do you better make some moves here dude in the next five rounds otherwise there's a good chance you're getting ready to lose this thing you know and and, and it was close Damn, was it cl- Did he even place? I think he did those last two. I think to the, the last. I think he his calf got up on round ten. Yeah, I can't. Yeah. I know that he did at some point because he had to. Otherwise, placed in round like seven and eight, I believe, back to back, and then fell back off. But yeah, he's twenty. I mean, he'll. It's not like so, his career's over, but no, not at all. And I was talking to Susan Canode either around nine or ten. We had went downstairs, and she was saying that when he won all that money there at the American, I guess he turned around and tried to invest it with someone. Ended up going bad. The person he invested with totally shined him fifty thousand mm-hmm. dollars, and he got into a very bad situation. Had to call mom and dad. Still lives with mom and dad. So then there was like this huge family feud drama going on like he was dealing with this all during the finals like so when he needed to be on his a game just rodeo just this and that he was i don't think he was there mentally at all yeah i'll go to like when we've talked to trevor brazil when he's you know you ask him like hey when what were your most special championships the last one or the first one and if you think about for someone like shad who looks like he may have a great career knock on wood you know he's kind of got that um just superiority to his his athleticism and what he can do but nabbing this first one and having it be bumpy as it did man you gotta think like if he puts it all together and he's like okay i figured that out first of all I ain't, i'm not gonna go in with the dudes that i don't know investing wise so i can keep my dollars secondly i kind of know what to expect now when i do get to the road to the nfr you know now that he's been a couple times and um what to do there i mean and he could be dangerous yeah, and he's young, dude. Twenty years yeah. old. You know what I mean? Like super dangerous. That's awesome. Yeah. Great for the sport, man. I mean, if you think about what Texas kind of showed, we've already been in kind of a good premium of athletes in the young. Still, you know, Casey. Still, I mean, he's he's not old, but I mean, he's definitely in a, in a realm that where he's. Been. Tim's right in the middle. Sage is right in the middle. You know, there's a lot of those premium folks, and then all these young folks, man, that kind of scared the hell out of those middle aged guys. That's just wow. This was almost like the, uh, a revamping of what the ERA did, you know, where kind of the top yeah. guys went over to the ERA and some of the veterans. And then you had, you know, all these this new blood come up and put on their deal. I think it was very similar to this to where there is nothing secure. And Trevor Brazil, you know, I mean, Trevor wasn't competing at the NFR this year. And he's, you know, pretty much slowing down or whatever direction he's going to go now that life takes him. But there's definitely, as you made mention, there's a, a, a new guard coming on. Yeah. 
So I mean, it makes for a great new year, a great new time. I mean, look, we're into the new decade, right? Like, you know, coming out of the pandemic. It's like just, yeah, man, what a rodeo is in a good spot, man. I mean, the yeah. fact that we were able to accomplish a lot of things the way we did for 2020 kind of tells you that the, the, fu- the future is really bright. I mean, like to be able to say they didn't stop, they figured things around. It really was an awesome rodeo. I mean, like I, I don't know much about the Texas format. I, I get an argument of whatever Vegas cares. You know, and a lot of that goes into the inconsistency of competitors, believe it or not. When you have that big of an arena, there's a lot more things that are playing in your mind. You have a lot more steps that barrel horses are taking. They can get moving faster. Same thing with, you know, rope horses. It goes into play. It absolutely does. That big arena changes everything. Even though they set it up the best way I think was possible, I loved the setup. But there's just more movement everywhere. And nothing went the way everyone, you know, I love experts, right? No matter what field it is but all the experts that said for like oh this bigger thing this bigger field is going to make this change or even like tie down was going to be i mean uh, team roping is going to be more open it was the opposite right like it was just it, it, it was it was team roping was tighter because it was faster for some odd reason because of the turns or whatever it was that the that, that the calves were seeing coming out of there like just nothing went the way experts predicted the rodeo was going to be and i i love that i love when they're wrong and uh, ends up being very exciting because of that. Enjoy our conversation with Jess Pope and Colton Fritzland. And following that, check out Last Call with Steve and his good buddy, NFR announcer, Andy Seiler. But up next, Ryland's Bull. This is Ryland's Bull, the rodeo news of the week. RFD TV's The American Rodeo will return for its eighth year in 2021. The 11-day rodeo competition kicks off on February 25th in the Fort Worth Stockyards for slack and semifinals, and the finals takes place over the weekend of March 6th and 7th, 2021 at the Dallas Cowboys AT&T Stadium in Arlington, Texas. San Angelo Rodeo will take place this year, April 9th through the 24th. Recently released country music albums that you should check out, January 8th, Aaron Watson, American Soul, Morgan Wallen, Dangerous. NFR Extra follows cowboys, talks to legends and country stars, and finds the stories that make up the season that leads to the annual showdown in December. Follow me, Nevada Caldwell, Brylan Bentley, and Steve Goder as we delve deep into the stories in and behind the road to gold. Listen to NFR Extra on Rural Radio, channel 147 on Sirius XM, every Monday at 6 p.m. Pacific, 9 Eastern, with our re-air Tuesday in the same time slot. NFR Extra, all dirt, all rodeo, all year. Hey, this is Chancey Williams, and you're listening to NFR Extra. Wrangler NFR bareback rider Jess Pope started riding sheep when he was seven years old. The Waverly, Kansas cowboy arrived in Texas for the 2020 Wrangler National Finals Rodeo as a man on a mission, and he didn't disappoint, competing against the best at his first NFR while winning the average in bareback. He's kept good company along the way, traveling with three-time Wrangler champ Tim O'Connell. Jess shares his year-long journey to the 2020 Wrangler and Far and all the feels of being there. Jess Pope, welcome. And hey, thanks for having me, guys. How has your new year been going so far? I mean, we're, we're a few been, weeks here. Been going pretty good. Uh, just been hanging out around the house, working, getting ready for calving and everything, and uh, catching some cows for people, and just you know going through my daily life. I guess uh, I go to Odessa the 16th or something like that. I guess well, it'd be this Saturday. I don't know what the date is, but so I'm gonna go to Odessa and just kind of been slow, just taking it a day at a time, ready for the rodeos to kick back off. Yeah, I mean, obviously it's gonna be a different year. Kind of know what to expect, not what to expect. Opposed to like last year was just man, just bizarre. But let's go back to last year. You know, you ended the season winning the NFR average and placing third in the world. Were those a year ago at this time? Were those goals that Jess Pope was saying, "This is what I'm gonna do and set out to"? Or how realistic was all that and way your the way your 2020 ended? Yeah, I mean, man, like that's been a goal and like a, a vision of mine since I was six years old when I first started rodeoing. Um, I mean, like 
going into the NFR, I come in sitting 11th, I think. And so my goal, like at that point in time, as of October 1st rolled around was I'm going to go to the NFR. I want to win the average. And then I'm going to see where that puts me for a world title race. That's what I did. I just had to go take care of business one horse at a time. And, and I just had fun, you know, I, just tried not to think about stuff too much is the the cards are going to fall where they're where they are you know they're going to lay the way that they are and and, uh, there's nothing I can do about it so as long as I go do my job they worked out the way I was supposed to you know I've I fulfilled one goal my goal next year is to to win the gold the gold buckle and the average so ready to start this year and just see how it works out the difference in your mindset wise was there more distractions less distractions what was going on during Texas for you uh, I mean, like with the COVID and everything, like we had random COVID tests and stuff. So uh, I pretty much just sat in my hotel room for the most part. Like me and Tim stayed in the same hotel and just did our deal. We just hung out, you know, get a good lunch, rest and and prepare for, for what we had that day. Um, I've never like been a part of the NFR in Vegas. I've been out there, watched. I've, I've been I've rode at the permit finals and it seems like there is a lot of distractions out there, you know. Um, but one, like one thing that Tim and I do is we don't drink the day before we get on. So like, even if we're in Vegas, I feel like I'd be just the same, uh, just because like that's, we do it all year long. We don't go party or nothing. And I mean, two days for the NFR, we party like rock stars, you know, and the last night of those party like rock stars, but, but during that time, like it's business, you know, and that's it. So we gotta, we gotta take care of business and, and just do our deal. A lot of guys have goals. You know, you talk about your goals and making it to the NFR, and I can't tell you probably anybody that runs their hand in a bareback rig and doesn't dream about being at the NFR. So starting off on 2020, what talk a little bit about your goals, like how you achieved those and what it was, because like I said, everybody wants to go to the NFR, but but you did it. Yeah, like, um, I mean, I'm still in college, and I have a great rodeo coach. I go to Missouri Valley College, where Tim O'Connell went, where Tanner Oz went to school, and there's been a lot of other good bareback riders to go there, and and uh, Coach Mason, he uh, went to school and was roommates with the 2000 world champion, Jeff Collins. So um, he is really good at setting goals. You know, like actually we actually get a Jeff Collins goal sheet um, from when he was in college, first started on his card and stuff. So uh, being able to sit down with him and have goals to look at from other people like Tim and Jeff and my coach. And and uh, so that's that helps a lot. You know, I, I really like a good spider web goal sheet and and uh, set the bar high, you know, you, sky's the limit. So set them up there and, and just build down on how you're going to achieve it. And, and that's what I did. Um, you know, 2020, I wanted to be a world champ, wanted to make my first NFR. Uh, I wanted to go in leading it. And, and there were some things that, you know, setbacks where I didn't come in leading the world, but uh, it'll happen one of these days. Was, was there much of an intimidation factor uh, as far as making the NFR and going there or was it just something that didn't even cross your mind uh it didn't really cross my mind like it it really didn't set in until I left to go down there like I mean you know October 1st rolls around man I made the NFR but it was just kind of it hadn't set into reality I guess so like when I left to go down there um it kind of all just set in and it was pretty cool uh Tim and I followed each other down there and but once I got there like I felt I felt confident I just felt kind of calm and and was excited rather than, you know, shaking and being nervous. And I mean, I've rode against them guys all year long. I've been on a bunch of them horses that are there and you can draw every one of them horses at every rodeo you go to. So, I mean, going there, I wasn't nervous at all. And I was, I was just ready to go take care of business and do my deal. 2020 was an emotional roller coaster for anyone and everyone, but bareback riding in its own is physically wearing. Like you ask anyone, that's something they're going to tell you. But how did you keep it together going into this season and the peak for NFR? I mean, at one point, every rodeo was canceled. You know, you guys all got sent home for the first time in I don't know how many years Cowboys were actually home for over a month. How did that all play out for you this season? Just kind of keeping it going of I'm going to go to the NFR. Uh, Like, I mean, I I had a really good winner um, that canceled Houston and everything, and I had I'd won my super set there at, at Houston. And so I was confident they shut it down and we knew the rodeos were going to come back at some point in time. It was just a matter of when, you know, so uh, my deal was just stay ready. So I don't have to get ready. Um, I was still doing my daily routine. I, I moved out to Colorado and lived with my girlfriend and her family and worked for them. And I was riding a bunch of colts for them and helping them calve and everything. And um, so just kind of taking care of business, I guess, you know, it was, it was no thing for me is, 
well, it's just like the off season. But I mean, nothing changed once we got to go back to rodeo. And uh, I had a first great weekend of rodeo and back, and and just had to keep building from there. It was super tough, you know. Every there's only four or five rodeos to go to a weekend, and you were riding against the top 40 guys in the world everywhere you went. And then if it wasn't like a huge big rodeo, you know, them contractors only have five really really good horses that you can go that you can win the rodeo on you know and then you were looking to place and there was a there was a lot of weekends where tim and i neither one of us won money uh you know just because you didn't have the right ones drawn but you couldn't you didn't didn't have a chance if you didn't go try them so uh it was tough you know the old bank account got tight there at the end of the year um i broke my ribs at the end of the year at, at uh filer out or smashed me in the buck and shoots and so I sat out uh, Labor Day weekend and the weekend after that, and then I just kind of had to tough it out to make sure I made the NFR for the last two or three weekends of rodeo. And, and it was really tough. It's hard on me, but uh, just being able to pull through, I guess, how bad do you want it and what are you willing to do for it? What's your daily routine look like? You talk about your daily routine. Uh, like when I'm at school, um, get up, have a cup of coffee. I, I like to go to the gym, work out um, early in the morning before everyone else gets there. <laughs> And, uh, and then go to class. I work at a feed yard when I'm at school, um, catching cows. And, and then going to practice in the afternoon um, there at college. And when I'm at home, get up, try to work out, uh, go feed cows. Like right now, the ground's frozen in the mornings and thawing out in the afternoon. So I'll feed and then try to go to the gym, you know, before lunch or right after lunch. And, and uh, just keep practicing, ride the spur board, wear that sucker out, uh, get on the bucket machine whenever I can. And and uh yeah just i don't know i like taking a minute at a time i guess i try not to get too planned out what's your workout program like uh so i have a wrestling coach there at school that makes my workouts and it's a lot of a lot of uh, lightweight repetition stuff you know but never really doing the same thing it's always two or three movements and when you start you don't stop until you're done and uh so yeah like it's i don't know it's just fast paced stuff a lot of cardio and a lot of abs it is amazing how many times wrestling gets inputted into rodeo and conditioning and who does it. Well, obviously, you're talking about Tim O'Connell. I know that he was a badass uh, where he came from, and it's just amazing how that discipline has transferred over to rodeo. A lot of folks at Bowers. Uh, anyway, just uh, yeah. funny. I didn't get to rodeo in high school, but I sure wish I could have. <laughs> so you didn't rodeo. When did you start riding bareback horses? Uh, I, I, I mean, I started riding bareback horses when I was a little kid getting on ponies and stuff. Did I say rodeo or wrestling? You said rodeo. Yeah. Oh, I didn't get I, I got you. Sorry. I got you, Jess. I, I know you were I was like, No, I didn't I was get like, the rodeo. <laughs> Damn, I rode, son. Uh, he was a high school I champion rodeo. rodeo. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, sorry, it's, I was it's a little so confused rodeo. here. Yeah. 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 No, my, my bad. Yeah, you're humble, yeah, my man. Brain like, got I really didn't rodeo in high school. My mouth works. Yeah. happens sometimes. I just thought you were being humble, man. He was like, well, you know, you're just a rodeo, yeah. you know, high school champion and whatnot, but I didn't really rodeo. <laughs> yeah. No, I rodeoed. I didn't wrestle. Sorry. My mind was working faster than my mouth. <laughs> Jeez. Uh, yeah. So it sucked, but whatever. I didn't really even get to play sports in high school. I was told I had to uh, choose between rodeo or sports my freshman year. So um, I just didn't play high school sports. Last time I checked, man, rodeo is a sport. No doubt about it. Jeez. Mm -hmm. They didn't think so, though. They thought football, basketball, and track were the only sports you could play. Yeah. So Yeah. Might not have the build for going pro on football, bud. <laughs> yeah. I hate to say it, but probably not. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> That's awesome, man. We will be back with NFR bareback rider Jess Pope. Following the break, Jess shares his NFR experience competing against his mentor, Tim O'Connell, plus – his greatest fear. In Las Vegas, December can only mean one thing, the Wrangler National Finals Rodeo. The NFR is a culmination for the top contestants in the world, seeking a share of $10 million purse and the coveted gold buckle. For the fans, Las Vegas transforms into the greatest Western party in the world with the NFR experience, which features Cowboy Christmas, the Junior World Finals, nonstop entertainment, custom viewing parties, and so much more. Follow all the action at NFRexperience.com. Great moments. Great Great champions, great memories. There is only one NFR, there is only one Vegas.
Glenn Allen Phillips. I'm general manager of the National Finals Rodeo and uh, joining you on uh, NFR Extra. We are talking to Jess Pope, the 2020 Wrangler NFR bareback average champ. Jess is no stranger to winning with having won the National High School Bareback Riding Championship in 2016. What's it like? How long have you been traveling with Tim and what's that like? Uh, it's like I've, I've been, I've known Tim for a really long time. Um, when I first went to college, I was on a permit and like later in the year, I'd go to some circuit rodeos with him just so he'd get his circuit count. And, and, uh, so I've been in the rig with him, you know, a little bit here and there for my freshman, sophomore year. My junior year was my rookie year. And, uh, it was awesome. You know, like he's my bet, one of my best friends, um, just we get in the rig, we kind of know what each other wants to do. And uh, we just go win, you know, like we just go do our job. And and uh, he's a real positive guy. We like to look out the windshield rather than the rearview mirror. And if you don't get, do good somewhere, you just forget that you went there. And uh, just being humble with him and, and going to rodeos, having horses. You know, like when you're on your rookie year, there's a lot of horses that you've never been on. There's stuff that, you know, like buckers that you've never had to get on. And, and uh, he was a lot of help to, to help in my mental game. Um, for that you know just being prepared to get on horses like that and he's just a real positive guy and I don't know I I wouldn't want to travel with anybody else how'd you get connected to Timmy um so when I was in high school uh there was an old man that lives down the road from me that picked up a bunch of rodeos Rod McGinnis um so I went everywhere with him I never amateur rodeoed or nothing like a high school rodeoed and I went with him and I would mount horses out at uh, every rodeo that he went to and stuff and he picked up um, a lot of good good rodeos around here uh that you know tim would be out for circuit rodeos and stuff granite falls palestine illinois uh the, the big ones for for our circuit anyways and uh so i met tim through him and he had known ray he picked up with ray for forever tim's dad and uh so just kind of fell in there you know i didn't know the guy i was actually terrified the first time i met him first time i ever rode with him was at granite falls i was a sophomore in high school and and I was mounting out, and I didn't even take my gear bag behind the bucket shoes. I was so I was so scared. Him and Tanner were both out, and that's Tanner's hometown rodeo. And yeah, I didn't I didn't take my gear bag back there. I got ready at the back of the trailer, and I walked back there, put my rig on, and said hello, and, and did not speak to him. And finally, like they made they like grabbed my gear bag and took it back there. Like while I was riding, I guess one of the uh, one of his one of the helpers, I guess, and sat my gear bag right by Tim's, and I thought I was gonna crap my pants sitting there visiting with him you know that was the first time i'd really met him but then after that it's just i don't know we became pretty good friends i'd send him videos and stuff and he'd help me out and dude what was the emotions going through in the nfr you're competing against not just tim but casey field and you're hitting here all of a sudden your name just keeps popping up there's this just pope guy on the average like oh no he's giving a run for these two stud champions what were the emotions going through man during that run for you uh, I mean, I get it's a lot different now, I guess, just because I'm I'm friends with them. Uh, I mean, it's pretty cool, like to, to have your name sit right beside them. But that's been a goal since I was in junior high. Is I wanted to be a bareback rider, and and that was when Casey Fields was just coming around. You know, it's like when I was in high school, my freshman year, I had to do a blog, and like Timmy, I, he, I don't think he had won a world title yet. I don't think he won a world title till my sophomore year of high school. But so I did this blog, and I studied what I thought were the three greats that had three different body builds. Um, when I was growing up watching Bobby Moat, Will Lowe and uh, Casey Fields, you know, they were the three hot guys when I was young. And that's who I looked up to. Well, I had actually been to a Will Lowe school. I started on the same bucket machine as him. Um, there was an old man down the road that lives 15 minutes from me. He's passed away now, but that's where Will started rodeo. And that's where I started rodeo. It's like, I've known Will but I broke down their three riding styles. Um, I had to make a blog for my English class and that's what I did. And, and I studied them. So it was actually uh, just trying to base my riding style off of Casey's because we were what I thought was similar builds. And uh, so, yeah, like being next to Casey was, was pretty cool. I mean, we're, we're pretty good pals now, but when I first came around, I was pretty nervous around him too. Good dudes, man. I mean, yeah, no need to be shy around those guys. Those guys are like some of the best guys I've ever met in the rodeo industry. Um, what is the difference between like a Casey Field ride 
and a Timmy O'Connell ride. I mean, they are different, but what, what, what can you explain a little bit of that since you wrote about it in college? Yeah. Well, uh, well, actually I was, that was in high school that I was high school. Sorry, my bad. uh, You know, I'm messing up words. Yeah. It's all good. Your brain's moving faster than your mouth. I get it. (laughs) But, uh, no, like Timmy, Timmy's a lot smaller build, um, than, than what Casey and I would be, you know, and Casey's a different build than I am. Like Timmy's got little short legs and a long torso and, uh, just his spur stroke is a lot different. He really comes out with his feet a lot more and uh, expose himself quite a bit more than than what Casey does or I do because they're so much shorter. You know, he has a lot more time to do whatever the heck he wants with his feet on the back course because it doesn't take him near as long to get him down because it's so short-legged. Uh, I mean, Casey, he has to kind of ride back a little bit more. You know, like Timmy, he sets up on them horses a little bit just because he can. He's so small. I mean, he, did, he can do whatever he wants up there. He's got, like, the perfect bareback rider build. But, uh, I mean, Casey, he, he kind of has to stay back a little bit more and, and his feet are a little bit longer, you know, there's a lot farther up the neck that he's got to go rather than Tim. And I mean, everyone has a different riding style. I've never seen anybody with the same spur stroke as anyone else. You know, everybody has their own little flaws. And, uh, but I'd say those are the two biggest things on Casey and Tim. They're both excellent at controlling their upper body. I mean, they, it seems like it never moves. So I'd say really the, the biggest difference on them is their spur stroke. That's crazy to watch those guys too. Like everybody now seems so like tight and in control. And you look back at like those bareback riders in, you know, say the nineties, I think is maybe nineties, early two thousands, where it's just wild. And you look at these guys like how's their neck not cracked in two by now. I mean, just, you look at some of those old school guys and it's just like, God, that just looks miserable. And now, I mean, obviously there's some rise towards like, Oh, Oh, he's a little bit out of control. And 20 years ago, it was like, Oh, he made it. You know, it's like, <laughs> that's, that's great. He's alive still. Yeah, but, man, the sports evolved. Like that's, what's crazy is looking back just within 20 years, you know, you look at the 2000 NFR compared to the 2020 NFR and, and that that's true. You know, the, the riggins have evolved, the gloves, the riding style, the workout schedules. Like I don't know of a bareback rider at the NFR this year that, doesn't work out all the time you know like it is an athletic event to where back then it was it was a cowboy event you know they didn't work out they were gonna go back there and have a cigarette and drink beer before they got on and and it it shows you know like I I would say probably 2012 is when it really kind of started to change I think for for the evolutionized and it just gets better and better every year now my opinion of it anyways there's some standouts like Jason Jeter is still, I mean, in great shape, but he was probably one of the few gym rats that, you know, that was a self self-proclaimed gym rat, but talk about, uh, the, with the progression of that, what about the Riggins? Mm-hmm. How's the Riggins and the gloves changed? Man, like the Riggins, I, I mean, down there at Barstow, they do wonders, you know, they're always looking to improve, uh, the Riggins. What can we do to make them better? is you can get under your rigging a lot more like the rigging set higher they're built better um you know it's just learning what works and what doesn't and finding the little things you know it's like a car the model t is way different than the cars today like they just find little things that work better that they're going to keep doing to it and and that's what they've done you know like them riggings back then they were just sat a lot flatter they they weren't shaped to horses backs near as good um and it, they really didn't know how to run their hand on their rigging. I mean, they did for that point in time. And then you have the guy that thinks, man, I can take epoxy and put that in there and build a shelf to where I don't have to have my hand near as tight rather than filling it full of leather. Um, just the way the tits on the gloves work, like it's it's really kind of a science, you know. They built them shelves and them riggings to where uh, it's like a mountain. So when you run your hand in it, it's, it's easy. You crack it around and your knuckles hit that shelf and – it doesn't have to be that tight, but you're buying it into where it can't come out. And now, tits, I want to go back to tits on a glove because not everybody might know what tits on a glove are. <laughs> yeah, the tits on a glove, like it's just a piece of leather. Them gloves are the way they make them is they're designed to have that in there. Like bareback riding gloves, not the same as what a regular working man glove is. It's a lot thicker. There's actually quite a bit of science that goes in that into that. Um, but a tit is really just a block of leather and there's one, um, like on the bottom of your hand, some of the guys ride with one on their ring finger. And then there's a little bitty bubble, um, up there on your index finger. And it's all they've, them guys that make gloves. Um, they've got it measured out to where they know exactly where they got a place. 
uh, the so-called tits um, and them gloves to where they're going to hit on the rigging perfect. What is your biggest, weirdest fear? Snakes. Those things freaking terrify me. Snakes and spiders, I'm out, dude. I will scream like a little girl and will not. <laughs> like if I pull into the into the driveway and there's a snake sitting there, I ain't getting out of my truck. I ain't doing it. <laughs> they, they ain't got legs, and the way they slither around and bend, and they'll bite you and everything. Some like blue racers will chase you. I'm out, dude. I don't I don't want nothing to do with that. <laughs> so I'd rather I'll do. I'd step in front of a bull, do whatever. I ain't getting in front of a snake. I ain't doing it. <laughs> I'll call my brother and tell him to come kill it or something, but I ain't getting out of the truck. <laughs> I don't blame you uh, at all. I like that you said they don't have legs. Yeah, they don't, dude. It's like how they they bend and slither and like coil up. Like, what the heck? How does that even happen? How does that work? How do you move? I don't get it. Like, Uh, do that, man? I can't. I mean, like us here in Nevada, we got a lot of snakes. But do you, Kansas? Yeah, you guys do, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, we got like rattlehead or rattlesnakes, copper moccasins, all sorts of stuff. I like every snake I see is a rattleheaded copper moccasin. They're all deadly. Uh, I don't care what it is, but they'll all kill you. If they're all the same, I'm out. I ain't doing it. Yeah, just avoid the situation at all costs. Uh, right. How many pranksters you got, man, but that might have opened up Pandora's box for anybody that didn't know that. And, yeah, right. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I've had my fair share of snakes taped into my truck bed or something, you know, or in my seat. So um, I've gotten kind of used to that, but I will guarantee to scream, jump, squeal, Maybe pee myself a little bit. I don't know. Depends on the time of day. But yeah, so <laughs> um, I don't know. Ho- I hope that I don't get pranked too bad on it, but it tends to happen quite a bit. Well, man, I mean, understanding the guys like Casey and Timmy, man. I mean, I'm pretty sure they will. They're they're good like that. Mm-hmm. They like they like to poke your mind a little bit. So. Trying to get that edge on the young guy. You go to Vegas <laughs> and you might have a full. Oh, yeah. man. Had they known that for night 10, dude, uh, they could have got him, but too bad. But. Yeah, I don't know. I'd, I'd have wigged out. I probably would have moved out of the locker room if there was a snake taped into my deal. <laughs> I'd have went and found a bathroom or something to hide in. Yeah, well, you're a lot like Indiana Jones, man. I I, I don't blame you, though. So, man. Yeah. Well, Jess, this was uh, fantastic, man. I thank you for uh, getting on with us today. And, um, man, nothing but true blessings for your, your, this 2021, not just for you, but everybody else on this planet and everything we, we went through and yeah, man, good luck with, uh, you know, I want to see you in Vegas for the NFR this year. Yeah. Thank you guys. I appreciate being on there and hope to see you out there. All right. Thank you, sir. Yep. Have a good one guys. You too. See you, Jess. You too. Hi, I'm mayor of Las Vegas, Carolyn Goodman. I'm so fortunate to be the mayor of the world's greatest city, Las Vegas. In addition to our world-class hospitality and lineup of hotels, shopping, dining, and nightlife, we are also on our way to becoming the sports and entertainment capital of the world. One of my favorite times of year is in December when we welcome the Wrangler National Finals Rodeo, Cowboy Christmas, and over 50 live concert events. Las Vegas becomes Cowboy Town. Rodeo fans can enjoy the hundreds of events up and down the Las Vegas Strip and in downtown. And fans can really enjoy downtown as the home of the hoedown, the official opening of the NFR, the fabulous new Circa Resort Casino, and all of the concerts and viewing parties at our other hotel properties. As we move into 2021, we're already counting the days until the NFR returns to Las Vegas, where it belongs. Can't wait to see you, and remember, there's only one NFR, there's only one Las Vegas. Hello everyone, this is Benji Bendeley, Wrangler National Finals Rodeo Music Director, and this is NFR Extra. He's no Nostradamus, but Wrangler and Far bull rider Colton Fritzlin is pretty darn close. In January of 2020, which seems like 10 years ago, he set three goals. One, to make the NFR. Two, to finish in the top three in the world. And three, to win PRCA Resist All Rookie of the Year. Amazingly, he did all three and added some icing on the cake by winning the average. Colton talks about the mental approach that got him to Arlington, facing six-time world champ Sage Kimsey and his weirdest fears.
Holden Fritzland. Welcome to NFR Extra. Thank you, sir. Glad to be on. Glad to have you on here. There's a there's a lot of noise being made last year in the bull riding world. We we're very accustomed to always just thinking, you know, Sage Kimsey, Sage Kimsey comes in, does his thing. We'd seen it so many times that it just we were getting used to it. And then all these names started popping up. You know, here we are, January 2021, but I want to I want to jump back real quick. This is coming from an interview you had, uh, I think it was almost about a year ago at this time. And you had this to say. You said, my goal this year is to make the NFR finish in the top three in the world and win PRCA Resist All Rookie of the Year. There's, you know, Nostradamus. There's all kinds of people and how they predict things and they're going to go down. But three out of three isn't bad with a prediction. And then, you know, a little, a little sprinkle on the top there with the, the, the cherry is uh, to win the NFR average. How do you feel about the way your 2020 began and ended up? You know, it was great. Um, you know, rolling through Odessa, you know, I made those goals in mind and wasn't ex- going to expect anything different of myself um, because I knew my capability myself. Um, you know, I had a really good winter run right there, you know, and then honestly, when COVID hit, I was sitting 16th in the world around March right there in Houston. You know, I had to live with that feeling for, you know, the two months that we weren't rodeoing. And I, you know, I took notes and learned that feeling of what I felt. Never and will not feel that um, in my career, you know, and I worked, started working a lot at it right then and there. You know, I didn't slow down at all. Um, kept getting on practice school, staying in the gym, keeping my mind sharp. I tell you what, when them rodeos started back up, I was fired up and uh, wanted to make the most of it and show up to each rodeo and do my job and uh, let them chip fall where they may. Then rolling right into the NFR, you know, came in tenth there, you know, and, and not where I wanted to be for sure, but I knew if I made the most of my, my finals, it was going to end up really good. And, you know, just kept the same mentality of, you know, show up, and do your job. That's it. Every given day. Talked to a few buddies before the finals and everything, and and you know that had been there, and you know they had just said don't don't blow it up as as much as as it can be, you know. And then I just try to keep it simple each day that I went, and uh, I tell you what, it was a good time. We talk about your first NFR, September 30th. You the season closes out. October, you guys get the call that you're going to the finals. It kind of starts to set in. But what was your first yeah. NFR being like in Texas? It wasn't in Vegas where, you know, everyone else is going to tell you this is what to expect. You kind of all huh. had a different experience there. Speak on that a little bit. Yeah, definitely. You know, um, I tell you what, when I got that call back, you know, for my first NFR, it that's really when it started setting in for me. And, uh, you know, and, and getting the word that it was going to Arlington, you know, I thought that was pretty dang cool. And, um, you, you could tell everybody was really fired up about it, you know, and, and, and it was going to be a change of scenery, but you know, the, the atmosphere when you showed up to that place was unreal, you know, the, the every day really, you know, but the first day that, you know, we got there, I, myself did, you know, it was feeling, I can't describe, you know, I was just fired up for it and, and ready to rock and roll. And, um, you know, it's a good thing, you know, everybody helped everybody out as far as where we needed to be. And, and how everything was going to run and how it was going to roll. And, uh, you know, it came together great. And I tell you what, that was a that was a great rodeo and definitely one of them, it is my favorite for sure. So with some of the contestants that talk about in Texas, obviously they live there and it was somewhat convenient for the way things laid out for them. Where do you live or where was it convenient for you or did it, did it even matter, Texas or Vegas? Yeah, you know, as, as me, it, it didn't matter. And I was just grateful that they were having a finals, you know, get, get that given year. Um, you know, and I've, I've lived in Texas now. This would be the third year now. Um, I went to school down here for two years and, and you know, never never left really. Uh, you know, I love it down here. The opportunities down here I feel like are endless for me. And, uh, you know, so rolling down to Arlington, it was, it was nice, you know. It was a good little, you know, about three-hour drive, you know, and uh, – getting there i was just fired up so uh you talk about the energy that and the atmosphere it wasn't like okay we're going to vegas and this is you know this is where you go this is what you do this is how we go about it did it feel like it was more of a level playing field since it was in a new location yeah you know there you know a lot of guys that had been to vegas you know were like you know it it wasn't like vegas you know is what they said and 
and you know i you know i never really look into you know any of that kind of stuff you know i just keep in mind to you know show up and, and do my job and but the atmosphere there and the energy level was i mean through the roof you know and i think you know, changing it up and changing the look of everything was, was really cool for everybody. And, uh, you know, the setup, you know, and how, you know, the arena was and, and everything that was put together really for the event got everybody fired up for it. And, you know, everybody, I think, rolled in there feeling really good and just wanted to win. I'm going to throw a little left curveball at you and pun fully intended. Talk about your family a little bit and how that kind of played into this role. Yeah. Um, you know, growing up, you know, I started riding bulls when I was about seven. You know, I was born into a, a ranch family and, uh, you know, just started getting on, you know, calves and steers. And, and I was blessed enough to for my mom and for my mom and dad to, uh, you know, always support me everywhere I went, you know. You know, when I was younger, I'd rope and stuff too, but, you know, bull riding always stuck out to me, and that's the thing I worked the most at. You know, my mom and dad and myself, we just worked at it every day. We'd get on practice bulls, we you know, ride horses, and then, um, you know, going off to college and stuff, they still helped me out and everything, and it was great to have them there. You know, I was very grateful and blessed to, to have them there, um, to, to feel that support from them, and uh, just kind of bittersweet bittersweet sorry when you when you look back at it and really puts a good feeling in you when you just work at it every day when you're younger to get to this level and you know but still working at it every day and you grew up in Colorado correct yes sir yep Rifle Colorado you know lived there till I went to college and then I went to college at Snyder Texas Western Texas College for uh two years and uh that's been it really so I've been down here ever since on top of that family stuff you know what were there some other influences that you've had? The cool part about being a rodeo family, right? There's there's connections. Rodeo is very tight knit group. Were there other influences yeah. outside of your family or even people you looked up to that that's who you're you're either imitating, mimicking, kind of look to steal from to add to your repertoire? I mean, is there any other influences outside of your family that impact your your professional career right now? Definitely. You know, growing up, um, you know, Cody Lostro, he you know, from Colorado and everything. And, and that guy's helped me out for, for a while now. That guy's a really good guy inside and outside the arena. You know, I really look up to him. He's very professional on what he does and everything. He's always been close with me as far as riding bulls and everything and trying to learn from him and everything. I feel like it was a blessing and stuff. And, you know, when I got down here, um, you know, I had a great support group down here when I got down here as well. You know, uh, Gary LaFue, you know, he's helped me out ever since I was little or two. And, um, you know, just there's a lot of people, you know, like you said, rodeo is a tight family. I try to learn from everybody I meet. And, uh, you know, it was, it, it's been great. I want to go back to the family side of it. Your dad was a rodeo cowboy, too, on a two event side of it, the bareback and steer wrestling. Did he ever, you know, hey, maybe stay away from them bulls and let's stick with some horse stuff? Yeah, uh, no, not a whole lot. When I was younger, I just, I told him I wanted to be a bull rider. Kind of seen the fire in my eye, and and, and that's what, what I had done. I bulldogged in high school and stuff, and I rode bucking horses and whatnot. But, uh, you know, I just, when I was younger, like I said, that's just what I worked at the most. I think him seeing the fire in me when I was younger and still, you know, he never has doubted, you know, hey, might want to go pick up a rope or something and whatnot, which is, which is pretty cool, you know, he, he supported me when I was younger and everything. So that was, that was good. That's awesome. Yeah. That, that'd be, that'd be positive to have the experience that your, your dad could, could help you with. What was his words of advice for your first NFR? Same deal. Just keep it simple. And, uh, he, he was fired up about it. You know, I could tell he was texting me every night and everything and pretty much telling me to give it my all and, and leave nothing behind, you know, kind of deal. So, you know, when I was younger, rodeoing with him, always hop in the rig with him and we'd go. I learned a lot going through with him as well. Use him lessons today. So let's take a quick break with Wrangler NFR bull rider, Colton Fritzland. And when we return, Colton talks about the power of sports psychology and how it led to his current success.
Every December, the eyes of the rodeo world are on the Wrangler National Finals Rodeo, the world's richest and most prestigious rodeo. And now you can follow the NFR all year long at nfrexperience.com. You'll find information on Cowboy Christmas and the Junior World Finals, unique blogs and content, access to NFR Extra, and much more. With the Stay in the Loop Club, you'll also have a chance to win a trip for two to Las Vegas 2021 for the world's greatest rodeo. Don't get left in the dust. Stay in the loop, stay in the know, and win at nfrexperience.com. Hi, I'm eight-time world champion bull rider Donnie Gay, and you're listening to NFR Extra. We are here with the 2020 PRCA Resist All Rookie of the Year, Colton Fritzlin. Along with capturing Rookie of the Year, Colton won the 2020 NFR Bull Riding Average, the first rookie to do so since NFR champ Sage Kimsey did it in 2014. Now, when you got to the NFR and the bulls that were there, was there anything that you were hoping that you had or something that you were excited to have? I was blessed this year to draw what I had drawn. You know, every round, I couldn't complain what I had. Really, the first round was like, you know, it's a feeling. It, you know, having Bumblebee at Pete Cars, you know, Hayden Shaw's, I'd seen that bull numerous times and everything, and, and you know, looked like he rode really good. You know, and getting that first one under my belt, you know, it just put all them nerves, a few of them, I should say, away. And, and then after that, it was just, you know, rocking and rolling. So I really, you know, this year definitely wanted to get on chiseled. Uh, the bull of the year, you know, that would have been, I think, really, really good matchup. But, uh, hey, we'll uh, we'll look forward to it this year. How do you handle these injuries, knowing that they're going to be coming, what you did this past year? How do you go about taking care of Colton, your body, your soul, everything, so you can get to the next rodeo? Right. You know, when I was younger, that was my biggest hiccup was injuries. Is starting at a young age, eight years old on up, you know, I was always, you know, breaking stuff and, and hurt, you know, always learned a lesson from each injury and knew that there was, you know, a bigger plan and, and it was going to work out, you know, and I, I was blessed enough to, to uh, get a hold of a sports psychologist when I was in high school, you know, right. And it worked out really perfect, you know, cause it was a year before when I was 17, I was getting ready to buy my permit and go, and getting a hold of her, you know, and really just the positive thinking and the law of attraction, you know, if, if you, you think it, you say it, it's going to happen, I believe. And if you believe enough, it thinks you're going to happen, you know. So now injuries really don't set me back. You know, I've been healthy ever since. I think it, that's the big major reason is that uh, positive thinking that, you know, it doesn't really cross your mind anymore and, and you're just going to roll with it. And if it does happen, you know, it's, it's for a bigger reason and it's going to work out in the end anyways. That sounds easier said than done. So how did you apply that to your life? <laughs> yeah. It didn't started with that, with the psychologist and everything. It was, it was rough from the, from the start, you know, because I was dealing with an injury and it was hard to see that it was, you know, I had a, I had broken my leg and it was right when I had qualified to the national high school finals and, you know, Shawnee and everything my junior year and I'm sitting there with a broken leg and then it ended up having a bone infection in as well so it was just an ongoing thing with it you know and it was at first it was hard to to see that end result you know but it's just something something in me clicked and a light switch came on and, and I just you know started doing it and worked at it every day shoot it's it's been great ever since you kind of blew over that bone infection deal, man. That's kind of a major thing. Did you have to have surgery on that? Yeah, I ended up, you know, I broke it and then, you know, they put plates and screws in it and my body was rejecting the hardware pretty much. So it was, it was literally pushing the plates and screws out of my, my leg. And I had, I think, two clean outs where they, that was a surgery, you know, where they went in, cleaned everything out, put new hardware in, you know, and and so on and so forth and then it got bad it got really bad and so we went to denver to um dr stoneback you know he had done a surgery prior to this he had actually taken everything out so that was another surgery and put a what they call an external fixator on it so pretty much just kind of like rods but it's on a halo and i was on that in iv antibiotics for a while 
you know, my mentality, I said, what can I do with this and kind of, and so on and so forth. And he said that I could remain in the gym, but I couldn't lift over 15 pounds. And so, you know, I, I went to the dang gym every day just with the knowledge and the mentality that I was going to get through it sooner than they thought it was and that I was going to come back stronger because I was working at it every day to tell you what, that's how it ended up because I was supposed to get surgery on my shoulder after my leg. They took an x-ray and an MRI on my shoulder and they said, we don't got to touch it. So I got my leg healed and I was back at it again and haven't looked back since. So how long from injury to recovery, how long were you out? (sighs) Roughly five months, I believe. Five, five and a half. And it was supposed to be a, you know, six week healing, you know, normally on a broken leg or something like that, you know, so. Did did you go back to the practice pen or what was your first bull after that one? Yeah. Um, you know, just started it slow. The main lesson I learned off that was just don't rush anything because it pretty much got infected because I was trying to get healed up, go to high school finals and all, so on and so forth. Well, then it didn't heal right. So then I just made up in my mind that I was just going to let it heal. So took it slow. You know, when I got the halo off, I started getting back on my barrels, you know, my drop barrel, stationary barrel, stuff like that, horses, you know, and just slowly ease back into it got on I had some practice pulls at the house started getting on them and then you know got my confidence back really that was the main thing that I had was all my confidence and then I just started entering and that was it you know if you think about how injuries were and definitely one like yours where it it makes you have to literally sit out right this goes along with any sport like it either makes or breaks that that athlete right like if if all of a sudden all they got to do is stew in their head with what they can or cannot do and all that emotions. And I mean, what it's, I think what it's shown for you clearly, because looking from what, what's happened since then, it really kind of, I think mended your mind to your body and knowing that, well, man, I can heal, you know, and, 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 you know, it it really elevates because you look at, I'm not kidding any sport, man. And I'm pretty sure this is in rodeo and I'm not going to pull up any details here, but the minute you have some sort of injury where, as your point, when you're getting IV antibiotics, man, I mean, it's not just not like a, normal run of the mill kind of thing. Right. And, and when that's happening, right. that, that gives you a choice. Eh, I don't know if I really want to do this anymore or um, yeah, I just can't wait to get back out on that bull or whatever it is. Right. And with that being said, you know, during that time, I kind of had a chip on my shoulder as well, which really helped me. Is, you know, I didn't want to be that kid that had all the talent and could ride, but just never could stay healthy. And, you know, I tell you what, that's what they were saying around that time, you know, is just can't stay healthy. And I tell you what, that that fired me up because I didn't want people to say that. And I wanted to make my statement, you know, haven't haven't looked back since. How do you stay healthy now? Do you got a gym routine or what do you do on your on your physical and mental stability? Right. You know, the gym, I'll go if I feel like I need to just, to, you know, I, I feel like I'm pretty active enough to stay in pretty good shape. You know, I'll get on practice pools quite a bit. If I don't got somewhere to go to, then I'm definitely going to get on some practice pools. And really the main thing I work on is my mental. I'm a stickler for that, you know, and just visualizing, you know, the feeling of winning and visualizing the bull rides that I want to make and how I want to look and how I want to look outside the arena as well, you know, and what I want in my life as far as that, you know, from riding bulls. You know, I feel – you know, most, most athletes don't work at it every day. You know, they don't do something to better themselves every day, you know, and, and I've always made a commitment to do something as far as, you know, if, that, if that's it, you know, getting on practice pools, writing my goals down, going to the gym, stretching, you know, I just work at it every day, knowing that the time I put into it is, is what I'm going to get out of it. So the visualization is huge. That's essentially meditation that you're talking about. Is that like you need a quiet place or what's your visualization time look like? I mean, it's whenever, you know, I mean, if you get in the state of Zen, you can, you can visualize anywhere you want. And, and, and that's where you're at your top is when you're in that state, you know, and and it's your, your mind doesn't know the difference between there and in real life. So if you can translate that and believe it enough, that when you show up, that's what's going to happen. It's, it's, it's bound to happen. So, you know, I mean, in the truck, I mean, it don't matter. I, I you know, whenever I'd like to, and, and just always thinking about it for sure. 
I love it. That's the mind of a champion right there. One last random question because we like to throw these in here. What is one of your either weirdest or biggest fears? Fears? Fears. Uh, yeah. I'd have to I'd have I'd have to go with snakes. I ain't I I'm not too high on them snakes. And and coming down to Texas, I haven't seen too many. You know, being from Colorado, they were always talking about them and stuff. And and I yeah, I care not to see them really. And that and, and not winning, you know, and, and losing. That those two really, you know, the the second one majorly. But you know, I I definitely want to leave my mark on this world and uh, gonna work at it. So visualize this then: you're riding a bowl in a just a just full of snakes, right? And like the whole piece is you got to stay on, man. That the, you got to win that ride all the way to basically to the shoots that you can't hit the ground. Yeah, that'll make you ride. I'll tell you that for a fact, me for sure. You know, yeah, I'll definitely make the whistle. We're not trying to give the kid nightmare fuel here. I mean, geez. <laughs> yeah, I better say, I'm probably going to think about that now. <laughs> yeah, negative. Go yeah. back to your positive Zen thinking. <laughs> yeah, man. If you ever just want to yeah. go, like, there's snakes down there. That's why I ain't, I ain't coming off this bowl. <laughs> ah, yeah. dang. That's a good way to put it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I might be able to ride one thinking like that. <laughs> yeah. Agreed. Dude, I don't know if anybody would. <laughs> Jeez. Well, you had one hell of a 2020, man. I um, This is to hear, you know, blessings and all good faith, man, for your 2021. We're buckling up for another r- <laughs> crazy run of rodeos and however they get put together. And nothing but luck to you, man, for this year. And hope to see you in Vegas come December. Yes, yeah, sir. Thank you all. I appreciate it. You betcha. Thank you, Colton. Have fun getting on those practice bulls. Yes, sir. Will do. Thank you all. I appreciate a bunch. <laughs> All right, Desperados, last call. I haven't been this excited for 21 since I myself was 20. (laughs) Because all of this just... Let's do this. All right, right, friends. This is Steve Godert, professional rodeo announcer and auctioneer. Joining me right now, my good buddy, the 2020 Wrangler National Finals Rodeo announcer, Mr. Andy Seiler. What's shaking, my man? Nothing to it, Steve. I was one of three. Okay, so before you start pandering, I was one of three, not the only one. So I didn't don't even start with that. One. I just said I just said NFR announcer, so you can't discredit yes. me on that. No, that that is factual. I I have the buckle and I'm keeping it. So yeah, did have an interesting, you know, chat with Jerome Robinson because so they were setting up the PBR here, and uh, you know, it's pretty cool to talk to like an old school cowboy like that. You know, I mean, a guy that's been there and done it all. <laughs> You know, I mean, yeah, there's nothing Jerome hasn't done. Those guys will forget more than you or I will. Oh know. God. And you, and you think you're cool until he like affirms the fact that he's been to damn near every continent with a rodeo, you know, I mean, he's like, yeah. Oh yeah, we shipped some stuff to Venezuela and Finland and we went to Japan one time and I'm like, uh, <laughs> you ever been to Nebraska? He's like, well, I live like 20 miles from there, but yeah. 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 You're cool too. Well, that's what's crazy too is, you know, I mean, I was around Cotton Rosser and the Flying New Rodeo Company crew for a while and all that they did, you know, going to Vegas was brand new. Then all the openings that they had, it was the never been seen before stuff. Yeah. And so, so the same thing with Jerome and the PBR and everything that they'd done along those lines, they had an opportunity to capitalize on something that has never been done before. Yeah. And so now it's like, well, how do you do that? What What has not been seen before? And it's... It's interesting to watch these guys too on how, you know, with Sean Gleason too for the PBR side of it, on how these guys capture an audience um, because everybody wants the newest, quickest, fastest thing, you know? And it's like, how do you do that with rodeo? Yeah. I mean, how many more times can you reinvent the wheel? You know, I, exactly. I mean, exactly. You know, I mean, we're, we're all looking for the new fan. Uh, so there's, there's no question about that. I mean, you know, I, I think rodeo is one of those sports that when you get somebody hooked, their allegiance is there, you know, I mean, yeah. but the, the new fan is, is what everybody's chasing in every sport because you, you want to create that, that experience for who's going to be here for generations to come, not just, you know, who's coming today. Yeah. That's when I was working for Feld Motorsports. Their target audience was were boys that were like five to 12 years old. Mm-hmm. I mean, that's who they wanted to get because they had that impact on them. And then 
it was, oh, dude, I got to take my son or my daughter because my dad took me when I was little. So it was exactly what you're saying is that multi-generational sort of a deal. But it works because, I mean, that's for me for the longest time. I mean, that's what I did. I grew up going to circuit rodeos, watching my dad team rope, you know, and yeah. and that's where I was hooked. You know, I mean, growing up, that's I saw that my dad did it and, you know, my dad looked cool doing it. And so I wanted to look cool doing it like my dad did. So how's that going for you? Uh, it, it's going okay. I mean, I, I can't complain. <laughs> Man, I'm super excited for 21 and uh, the direction that it's going to go and just kind of watch things unfold. But most of all, baby, I am looking forward to going back to Las Vegas. Oh, please bring it on. Like uh, there's, <laughs> there's so many things and, and I'm, I'm so appreciative of what Texas did. I, I really am because it was nothing short of a miracle and the Rangers were great hosts um, you know, there, there was just a, a, a group of people that pulled together to make sure that the national finals rodeo happened. And Vegas is included in that because they said, yeah. Hey, we give you a one year hall pass. You guys go to Texas, get these Cowboys paid. Um, but to me, uh, Vegas is the home of the NFR since the year before I was born. And all the memories I have of the NFR growing up from the old, you know, uh, Winston rope and shoots and stuff. I mean, just, you know, just going back to the eighties and, uh, the nineties, the battles you had in the timed events were heck there were, there were people that would stay for the tie down rope and before they would the bull riding sometimes because they wanted to see Cody Ole and Fred Whitfield battle it out, you know? So that, that's what I grew up on. And, and there's a little bit of nostalgia for me, obviously. Uh, but, I also like playing craps. I also like <laughs> going to nice dinners with my wife. So, uh, so yeah, I can't wait for it to get back to Vegas. Yeah, it'll be good, man. Well, hey, it was awesome catching up with you, Andy, and I appreciate your time. And I uh, look forward to seeing you on the NFR Extra more, and we'll be checking in with you and seeing how your summer develops and uh, some great new stories from the rodeo trail from you, buddy. Thank you, Steve. I appreciate you having me on. We want to give many thanks to Jess Pope and Colton Fritzlin for starting off our 2021 right here with us on NFR Extra. Want to experience more of NFR? Then visit nfrexperience.com. And we invite you to subscribe to NFR Extra on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, iHeartRadio, or wherever you're listening right now. If you like what you've heard on NFR Extra, we would love it if you gave us a big five-star rating and tell your friends how to subscribe. NFR Extra. All dirt. All rodeo. All year. And the bulls and the bronx And the ladies in the skin-tight ringers And the cowboy hats